Okay, welcome, Illinois. I, I'm sure you've probably heard me and Dr. Derevinsky speaking here, but we want to welcome you to Gambling and Young Adults, Understanding Youth Gambling. My name is Robbie Fuquay, and I will again be your uh, host today, and we are so happy to have Dr. Jeffrey Derevinsky uh, from McGill to be speaking today on Gambling and Young Adults and Understanding Youth, youth Gambling. But before um, I give him uh, a formal introduction, I do want to uh, give you some training updates. And, and I have to say, this is the last training. I, th I realized that when I was logging on a while ago. This is the last webinar, I should say, not training of the year. I'm still in the middle of our third installment of our uh, Illinois Core Gambling Workshop. But uh, what a year it's been. And uh, I, I tell you, uh, I want to thank everybody who has participated on these webinars. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Derevinsky and everyone else, all the great speakers we've had this year. And what a great way to finish out the year uh, uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Derevinsky speaking on youth and gambling, but so this is the last gambling of the year, but our, our, I'll tell you a little bit about what's coming your way, and that's why I wanted to share with you. Uh, as far as training updates, the next webinar will be on financial recovery, where we're going to have Mark Lefkowitz. I believe we've had Mark uh, present uh, to, to you guys before. He's been doing this forever. I call him the grandfather of gambling training. He's great. I did one with him yesterday, but he's going to do a talk on financial recovery. It's it's going to be a two, we're, we're experimenting here. So we're going to do a two hour uh, a webinar that day. And so you'll get be able to get two CEUs with that. I, I believe I got that uh, um, approved through IODAPCA. But uh, yeah, it's going to be a two hour training on January 5th. Okay, and then February 9th, we're bringing in Don Feeney, uh, a researcher. Uh, he's going to be talking about my generation, generational differences in gambling and behavioral attitude, attitudes. Again, that's Don Feeney. Don's been doing this a long time as well. I've, I've worked with Don on some webinars, and he's got, and I've seen this one. It's great. He mixes a little bit of entertainment with his clinical information and research uh, and current research. So that'll be one to look to as well. That's February 9th. Uh, I do want to let you guys know and update you on our uh, Illinois Core Gambling training that we're doing now online. I'm about to finish the third installment. I, I say that if I sound like a, a proud father, I am because we were able to, to get everything converted over to an online version. And uh, I want to thank IODAPCA. I want to thank, of course, the Illinois Department of Human Services uh, for helping us out with that transformation through the summer into the fall to be able to give you the third installment. I'm finishing up Friday uh, morning on that. That's our last uh, eight, uh, eight session, last installment of the year. But we are going through all those trainings that we had to unfortunately cancel for the year due to COVID all the way back in March, April, when me, uh, Dr. Ledgerwood and I, uh, Dave, were going to present, uh, we were kind of switching off between cities, uh, presenting you all these uh, in-person core gambling workshops. So I'm working through right now, just so you know, uh, everybody's been placed on a wait list. So as your name comes up, as these classes and opportunities to present the workshop online come up, I'm going through those canceled names and, and wait lists. So your names, if you're if you were on those lists, it's coming. The next class is January 20th. Okay, it starts January 20th and runs through February. And again, that's the online core gambling training. If you haven't received an email yet, that means you, you your name hasn't come up on the wait list. We hope to be able to present more uh, in the coming year of 2021. And we hope, as uh, Jeff and I were just speaking earlier, with the vaccine coming, I hope we get some traction. And I thought I'd never say this. I, I can't wait to get back on a plane and see you guys to do some business travel and do these trainings in person. So uh, listen, thank you for all your patience and participation throughout the year. So with saying that, in order to get your CEU today, guys, be sure that you're on the, the, the entire webinar. Uh, this one, uh, Dr. Derevinsky has told me that it's gonna run a little bit over. So stay if you can, if not, we understand, but you get your CEU, you have to be on the call just up into the hour. Also, you have to answer Answer the poll questions. That's how kind of we, we, we gauge participation. So answer the poll questions, be on for the full hour, and that's how you'll be receiving your CEU. So without further ado, Dr. Jeffrey Derevinsky is a PhD from out of McGill University. Um, 
He's the director of the Clinical Training and School in Applied Child Psychology and a professor there at the Department of Psychiatry at McGill. He's a clinical consultant to numerous hospitals, school boards, government agencies, and corporations. Dr. Derevinsky has published widely in the field of gambling, adolescence, and de developmental psych psychopathology and in the editorial, on the editorial board, board of multiple journals. He's the author of more than 250 peer-reviewed journal articles, 60 book chapters, and four books related to gambling disorders and behavioral addictions, as well as being on the editorial board, uh, again, of uh, multiple journals. Uh, Dr. Derevinsky is the director of McGill University's Youth Gambling Research and Treatment Clinic and International Center for Youth Gambling Problems and High-Risk Behaviors. Dr. Derevinsky and his team have helped government's established research priorities and it has been instrumental in the development of responsible practices, the development of treatment centers, prevention programs, and social policy recommendations. He's a child psychologist, has testified before governmental bodies, not just here in the U.S., but also Canada, where he uh, reigns from uh, also Europe, Asia, and Australia, and is considered an expert in the field of youth gambling and behavioral addictions. I heard uh, Dr. Derevinsky speak for the first time at my first national conference a couple of years ago. Jeff, you were uh, speaking um, at, uh, it was in Cleveland, and from there, I, I I, I got a feeling you knew what you were talking about, so I'd love to hear what you uh, will have to say today, and I always learn to hear from you when you're speaking on gambling and young adults, and without further ado, sir, I will pass it over to you. Thank you very much, Robbie, and thank you all for uh, participating in today's webinar. Um, as Robbie mentioned, it's I'll probably go over a little bit, uh, have another meeting after this, so um, but all the slides will be available to you. So uh, some of them I may have to skip over, uh, and some of them I may have to do fairly quickly. Um, but what we're gonna do is we're going to start with poll question number one, uh, indicating your experience working with adolescent problem gamblers. Have you ever worked with an adolescent problem gambler? Uh, would you prefer only working with adults? Good job, guys. You're strong out of the shoot here. We're at about 60%, 75%. We'll wait. We'll give you a few minutes, or a few seconds, I should say, not minutes. T minus 10, we're about 93% voted. So I'm about just to indicate your work experience with adolescents, adolescents and problem gamblers. This might be all we get. Here you go, Dr. Dervisky. Thank you. Um, you know, clearly uh, less than half of you have ever worked with uh, an adolescent problem gambler or a young problem gambler. Uh, this is not atypical. And the good news on this poll here is that about a third of you indicate that you're very willing to work with problem gamblers, adolescent problem gamblers. Part of their problem is getting these problem gamblers into treatment and bringing them in, breaking the barriers to uh, seeking help by adolescents. So I hopefully you'll learn a little more about adolescent problem gamblers and young people who have gambling problems. Uh, our clinic works with adolescents and young adults. So uh, I will hopefully will be able to show you some information about what's happening. So I, the first thing I'd like to do is to share with you uh, some definitional confusion. Uh, the gambling industry likes to refer to themselves currently as the gaming industry. Gaming has no has few negative connotations associated with it. But what we're going to be talking about here are those people who are gambling, wagering money in order to win money. Um, Gambling is now considered a behavioral addiction. Uh, and this has become popular with the inclusion in DSM-5, also in the ICD, international. Uh, 
classification of gambling addictions. It's designed to differentiate between substance abuse and dependency. It's moving out of impulse control disorders. And it's prompted by research showing its classification really didn't fit in all that well with an impulse control disorder, and it didn't fit in all that well with a substance abuse disorder. However, there are some similarities. And there's a concern over the rise in the number of individuals with internet gaming disorders and excessive internet and cell phone dependency. And I'll just briefly touch upon that later on. Uh, also, I want to refer you back to our website, which is www.youthgambling.com. We've written many, many papers along with my students and faculty. And you can look at that website, download some of the papers, and if there's anything else you need, please feel free to email me. What are some of the characteristics of a behavioral addiction? Well, they re typically represent a part of normal behavior. That is, the vast majority of people, adults in fact, gamble. And that's true of adolescents as well. It's only a small percentage of individuals who seem to be exhibiting difficulty. And the concern is when they become excessive. And it's not only in terms of frequency or money spent wagering or gambling, but it, in order for it to be a real problem, it has to impair other parts of one's life. There are actually six identifying characteristics of a behavioral addiction. Uh, salience, where the activity becomes the most important thing in the person's life and dominates his or her thinking, feelings, and behavior. There's an emotional reaction to the behavior, which is, which is typically viewed very positively, but then it often serves as a coping strategy or arousal, or a numbing of adverse events. So people will often gamble, they'll gamble as a form of psychological escape to avoid some of their existing problems. The other characteristic, in order to keep the same level of excitement and enjoyment, one has to increase the amounts of the behavior to achieve that effect. So with respect to gambling, we're talking about spending more money more frequently. In terms of withdrawal, when they try to stop, there are problems or when they try to cut down, there's typically some sort of conflict and the conflict can be between uh, peers. It, uh, with young people, it's often between their, themselves and their parents or can involve other conflicts in terms of school-related behaviors. And what you see is very similar to drug use and drug dependency. When one tries to cut down or stop, relapse is often reoccurring. And uh, one of the things that we have to do in our treatment of individuals is to really talk about relapse with them. Uh, with young people, we tend to call them slips, so that uh, if you have a slip, we need you to come back to our center. What are some of the consequences? Well, we know that there are short-term rewards that result in the behavior, despite knowledge of some long-term adverse consequences. Uh, the repetitive engagement interferes with functioning in other domains. If you're gambling for long periods of time, you can't be doing other things. And there are many similarities with substance abuse and dependence, and you could see those on the screen. Uh, there's a dysphoric mood state, often accompanies a decrease in addictive behavior. So rather than uh, removing the depression, in fact, when you take away the gambling from young people, it often increases the depression. Uh, and when you ask adolescents and young adults why, they will say, you just took away my favorite activity. Uh, there's a high degree of comorbidity with other mental health and addictive behaviors, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, and other psychiatric disorders. There's a comorbidity with depression, OCD, anxiety, conduct disorders, and ADHD. 
And uh, this often results in lots of interpersonal difficulties between partners, between parents, between teachers, and between peers. So what's so different today? Well, we know that technology is here and it starts really, really early. And we're not going to talk about all that much about the nexus between gaming and gambling. Just suffice to say, there is a clear integration between those two. Uh, and so we have teenagers and young adults who are spending much more time on their cell phones, actually not talking on the cell phones as much as texting, gaming, or in fact, gambling as well. If one takes a biopsychosocial approach to understanding health, you could see the biology that's involved, the social context that's involved, and the psychology that's involved. All these are interacting in order to get to, as a way of trying to keep young people healthy. The changing face of gambling, well, this is what Las Vegas looks like today. Um, it may be a little quieter because of COVID, but certainly it's the mecca in the US of all gambling opportunities. But in Illinois, you don't have to go all that far. You can actually see some of your own casinos. Uh, and I often like to use the analogy with the field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. This is what the inside of casinos look like. Certainly very colorful, very bright, dizzying carpeting so that your eyes actually look up. And if you pay attention to the slot machines, you will note, or the VLT machines, you will note they're actually at eye level. And here's a typical roulette wheel. What's interesting is if you could look on the right-hand side and see this tote board here, um, this board shows you the last 12 or 14 spins of the roulette wheel. And you could see here, you could see what's called hot numbers. Those are numbers that have come up frequently. Sometimes they'll show you the reds or the blacks or the greens or high numbers and low numbers all designed to give people an illusion of control, a false belief that they can actually predict the outcome. The problem in a roulette wheel is that little white ball that runs around that wheel can't remember where it landed last. But the gaming operators are trying to give people the belief that they can actually predict the outcome of an event. If you can't predict the outcome of an event, then everything is purely random and many people would not do that. But the other thing about gambling and advertising of gambling is they tend to show you really exciting pictures and everyone is smiling and everyone is happy. We, we see that uh, poker stars, uh, which has kind of fallen off a little bit, poker playing has fallen over the last few years, but these are recognizable signs for young people. And there's lots of Texas Hold'em charity tournaments. You can go on Facebook and you could see a variety of uh, sites on Facebook. If you go to this site, Party Poker, and I just use that as an example, you could play for free or win for real. And these are what we call social casino games. And there have been some studies that suggest that you're much more likely to win when you're playing a social casino game uh, for fun as opposed to playing for money. But if you're winning playing for fun, the natural inclination is to say, gee, had I only been playing for money, look how much money I would have made. And we can play now on our mobile devices. In fact, mobile gambling is now the largest uh, growth area in the gambling field with many, many casinos and gaming, gambling operators actually moving their platforms online and online gambling, whether it be through sports wagering, we could talk about that in a second, or through typical casino type games. And you could gamble in your bed at night, so you don't have to worry about doing that at any time. The other thing I want to suggest is that gambling has become normalized in our society. This comes from a toy store where you could buy a blackjack success set, 
and the per person in the picture is Chris Moneymaker, who was the first winner of the World Series of Poker. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see chocolate poker chips for kids uh, versus regular poker chips. Uh, and uh, one of the things that you note is that it's become so normalized, you can find these in food stores. You want to get girls more involved or females more involved, what you do is you make pink poker chips. But you can have a variety of games that can be held uh, and you can walk around with. Here's one for Texas Hold'em, another for Blackjack, another one for poker. You can actually buy music to play poker by, and you can hear Kenny Rogers sing The Gambler or Elvis Presley sing Viva Las Vegas. You can buy professional dealer kits. And for Valentine's Day, which is coming up, uh, here you see it in both English and French because we live in Quebec and it's a bilingual country or bilingual province. Uh, and you could see Valentine, you're the real deal. And inside you could buy chocolate shaped as either poker chips or as playing cards. If you go on eBay, which I did on November 24th recently, uh, and you type the word gambling in, you will get 2.4 million listings. If you look at poker, you'll get almost 55,000 listings. Don't stick with just eBay, go to Amazon, and Amazon doesn't give you the number of listings like uh, eBay does, but uh, there were more than 10,000 listings for both gambling and poker on Amazon.com. Some of my favorites are, this is one where you can send in your photograph and I'll put your picture on a poker chip. Or if you want to get a little more cultural, you could get this deck of cards. Or if you're into music, you can actually get poker chips in a musical guitar case. We know that lottery scratch tickets are very, very popular, especially amongst young people. Not all that difficult to purchase in spite of legal prohibitions, but you could see a number of these tickets that are particularly enticing and have children or young people's themes related to the gambling. This one also comes from Illinois, uh, where uh, once again you can see Monopoly. Or here's another one from the state of Illinois where you could get Willy Wonka tickets. Um, or honeypot tickets. Pictionary, another game that was developed for young people. And you can buy tickets for good causes. Here, buying a ticket for cancer. You can buy tickets for that have a sport theme. So here you have one for the Boston Celtics, you have one for the Boston Bruins, or the Houston Texans. You can have special theme tickets like uh, Golden Ghost for a holiday. These, uh, are, this one's from the state of Illinois, where you get Christmas trees and peppermints. You could buy Betty Boop tickets. They that actually license many games that were developed for children uh, to uh, different lottery corporations. If you go into Macau, which is an island right off of um, Hong Kong, you can actually see, uh, if you look at this wheel over here, you can actually see that it says roulette, and this is in a children's playground. Or you can look at a casino where you have slots for adults and slots for kids. And you can see young people gambling in order to win tickets which they give exchange for prizes. And it is not unusual for parents of young kids to be playing these as well. We know that poker, World Series of Poker, or Poker Stars, very popular. Here you see a couple of winners, uh, Joe Cada, age 21, who is a community college dropout, wins the World Series of Poker. Here you see Jonathan Dumel, another dropout from Quebec, who won $8.9 million, and Ryan Reese, who wins uh, $8.36 million in 2013. At least he's a recent graduate and didn't drop out of college. This is a picture from a uh, 
what is referred to as a fruit machine in the seaside resorts in the United Kingdom. And you, there is no minimum age. Uh, they are now trying to institute a minimum age starting next year, which would be for age 18 years and older. Or you can go when you can travel. Uh, this comes from a, uh, an airport where you could see their advertising uh, in the carriage, um, in the luggage carousel. Uh, a group actually tried to come up to Canada a number of years ago, actually almost 14 years ago now, where they were trying to teach kids the correct way to play Texas Hold'em, trying to run a summer camp. Um, the reality is that while you could teach kids Texas Hold'em uh, and to develop some of these skills, these skills actually do not transfer to anything other than gambling. Uh, gambling or gaming has become glamorized, and we have our friend here, Mr. Bun, who can be seen always playing uh, Baccarat. And if you don't like this Mr. Bun, you could go back to this Mr. Bun, who also liked to engage in gambling. A number of gambling-related themed movies, Bubsy, Ocean's Eleven, Casino, and Mark Wahlberg's The Gambler, or uh, Chess and Timberlake in Run and Runner, which was about online gambling. One of the most popular gambling films was 21, based on the uh, MIT card counters and uh, how they got into trouble. So where does Illinois rank in terms of accessibility and availability? Well, these are the top gambling addicted states in 2019. And you can see that Illinois is uh, number nine, I believe, on that list. So out of all the states in the US, uh, obviously Nevada is a very important one, as well as New Jersey. But you can see Illinois is not all that far down the list. The types of gambling available in Illinois, they have over 35,000 gambling terminals, 10 casinos, three racetracks, the lottery, gambling parlors, bingo, and 18 or more to place wagers on sports. I thought this was particularly interesting. Uh, sign at Rosalie's Lucky 7 Cafe, which is right next door to Rosalie's Hair Design in Niles, Illinois, where you could play here uh, advertising casino type games. Uh, and here you could see with respect to sports books apps, uh, DraftKings and FanDuel are very, very popular, William Hill and PointsBet as well. Uh, and you can get promotional materials from them as well. Uh, the Illinois sports betting market is uh, really relatively new. Uh, but it, in, it's already racked up $305 million in their handle in terms of wagers. Uh, and that is interesting considering the first legal bet was placed in early March. And then uh, a lot of the sports teams that are being touted were actually closed. So the second poll question is can re gambling really be dangerous for young people? They don't have a lot of money. So I'd like you to indicate whether or not you think it could be uh, dangerous for young people. Yes, can gambling be really dangerous for young people? Just uh, mark A for yes, B for no, and if you're not sure, just mark number three there, C. Or <laughs> letter C or number three, I forget how it's presented there. And boy, we've already uh, got 84% that, 86% that's voted. So good job, keep the answers coming in. And T minus 10 seconds. Can gambling be really dangerous for young people? Okay, 
So um, I certainly concur with everyone that gambling can in fact be dangerous for young people. <laughs> yeah. In spite of the fact that most people, most adults do not view gambling as a problem for young people because they'll say they don't have enough money to gamble. Uh, but the, re the reality is they in fact do gamble and they can actually have some problems. A young man walked into my office for help uh, wearing this baseball cap, and I asked him if it would be okay to take a picture, and he said, sure, but he said, Jeff, if you lose $10,000, they'll send you a baseball cap for free. Uh, seems like a pretty expensive baseball cap. Here, I took a picture of a uh, one of our uh, clients allowed us to take a picture of their credit card statement and what you could see here going down the line pokerstars.com the reason why is because this was a Canadian card and so the US dollars were translating needless to say this individual had lost $20,000 uh, he had taken his mother's credit cards and lost $10,000 on each credit card in a one month period of time. There are some developmental issues that are important to understand. Uh, for example, risk taking, experimentation. This is the nature of adolescence. This is the first generation of youth exposed to accessible and varied gambling venues, and these Gambling venues are increasing, especially in terms of online. Uh, gambling has become the new rite of passage. Historically, teenagers, when they came of legal age, when they became 21, will go to a bar. Today, they're very likely to want to go to a casino. And the other thing that's important is to note that the minimum legal age to place a bet around the world varies. And that varies not only for, for just general gambling, but also specific forms of gambling. So in some jurisdictions, like in the US, it's typically uh, relegated to age 21, and that's nothing to do with gambling as much as it has to do with the fact that alcohol is often served in casinos, and so that's why they are able to gamble on, uh, or the age is restricted to 21. Typically, we find uh, scratch tickets being uh, having a lower age. Uh, and uh, in the UK, you can actually buy a lottery ticket legally when you're 16 years of age. We know that adolescence is a period of brain maturation, but this brain maturation is really not complete until about age 24. Uh, so uh, turning to Poll question number three. Adolescents engage in many potentially risky behaviors, including smoking, alcohol use, drug use, and gambling. Which behavior is most prevalent among adolescents? Is it going to be alcohol, drug use, cigarette smoking, or gambling? Okay, the answers are coming in pretty quickly. We're about 60%. Okay, T minus 15 seconds. Give everybody a chance. A few stragglers out there. We're at 89%. Okay, here you go. So the vast majority of you think that alcohol use is the most um, frequently engaged in potentially risky behavior, along with cigarette smoking, uh, and then gambling comes in next, with drug use uh, actually being less uh, than all three. So I'd like to kind of turn to 
some involvement in, in risky behaviors. This comes from some of our research, but there's been lots of other research done all over the US and internationally. If you look at total use and going from grade seven to grade 11, so we're talking about 12, 13 year olds to about 16 year olds, what you see is that um, when you, we say total use, we say, have you ever used this substance in your entire lifetime? So one would expect to have an increase going from grade through grade 11 uh, in each of these addictive behavior, potentially addictive behaviors. The important thing to note here is that there are more young people That is relatively flat, but it's flat high. And so what we know is that in order to work with young people as a prevention tool, we really have to intervene early. If one looks at the right-hand side of this table, you could see weekly use. And once again, uh, gambling is the most highly endorsed behavior. Uh, and so we know that there are a lot of people gambling and again, we define gambling as wagering money in order to win money. So what do we know about problem gambling severity? Well, the first is that most people are what we call social recreational gamblers. They gamble occasionally. Uh, and then there's another segment that really is not involved in gambling. And then finally, we have those individuals who are at risk for gambling problems. They're they're endorsing a number of items on our gambling screens, but not reaching the clinical criteria. And then finally, we have a group of people that we used to call compulsive gamblers, problem gamblers, pathological gamblers, but today we tend to call them disordered gamblers. Um, and we know that adolescents actually have a much higher prevalence rate. So what are, what's our current state of knowledge? We know that gambling amongst young people, like adults, is much more popular amongst males than females. Adolescents and young adults are uh, great risk takers. The prevalence rates of problem gamblers are two to four times that of adults. And among those individuals, 18 to 25, they have the highest prevalence rates of disordered gambling amongst all adults. Gambling's become a family activity. Uh, it often starts off with family members, and uh, we're now in the midst of our 19th campaign, and Illinois is part of that campaign, trying to educate parents not to purchase lottery tickets as holiday gifts for their children. Uh, people with gambling problems have poor coping skills. They report gambling at earlier ages, approximately age 10. And so our in prevention programs, and I refer you back to our website, really start looking at children as young as nine and 10 years of age, where we've developed some curriculum. Uh, there's a rapid movement amongst young people from social recreational gamblers to problem gamblers. And surprisingly, we when we did this research, we see that both that problem gamblers see both the benefits and the risks associated with excessive gambling. But they believe the risks associated with gambling won't happen to them and it will occur at a much earlier age. They believe gambling to be a relatively benign activity. Uh, again, this goes back to our socialization of gambling and few fear getting caught gambling. Uh, and that would not be true for smoking cigarettes or using alcohol. And what you could see here is children in grades four, about uh, age 10, some of our early studies, but these have been uh, replicated uh, most recently in some more of our studies that show as you get older, your fear of getting caught gambling actually diminishes. Uh, these individuals have lower self-esteem compared with adolescents, higher rates of depression. Uh, when they're gambling, that high risk for suicide ideation and suicide attempts. Uh, there's increased delinquency and criminal behavior. Uh, they have family relational problems. 
and they do have a support group, but their support group tends to be not their old friends, but rather what we often refer to as gambling associates or people who also like gambling. Uh, they score higher on measures of excitability, extroversion, impulsivity, and lower on measures of conformity and self-discipline. They score low on measures of resiliency. They experience more major life events and early childhood traumas. Uh, they're more likely to have parents with a gambling problem, other mental health or substance abuse issue. They display significant cognitive distortions and are remain at risk for the development of an addiction or multiple addictions. And here, once again, you could see that as you go up in gambling severity from uh, yellow, which is no problem gambler, to gambler, alcohol use increases, drug use increases, and smoking also increases. Most youth view gambling as a socially acceptable and enjoyable form of entertainment, entertainment significantly less harmful than alcohol. And uh, it's not, it should not be surprising that adolescents are easily influenced by advertisements and pop-up ads on one's computer or smartphone or viewing gambling advertisements on in sporting arenas are very, very popular. Problem gamblers also have more gambling related legal problems and PPG stands for probable pathological gambling. But you could see as you go from non-gambler all the way to some gambling problem, they have more legal actions pending against them. How do we assess? problems? Well, firstly, we look for things like lying, chasing losses, borrowing money, uh, always betting more, being obsessed with gambling, being unable to stop gambling, gambling uh, at a psychological need. There are a number of instruments that have been used or developed or modified from adult instruments. One is the DSM-4-MRJ, uh, which was based on the DSM-4 criteria, uh, the SOGS RA, uh, or the KG, which is the Canadian Adolescent Gambling Inventory, uh, which was one developed specifically for adolescents. And uh, in a number of studies, we've used the NORC Diagnostic Screen for Gambling Problems when we were only able to ask a limited number of questions. Prevalence rates for youth gambling range anywhere from two to 5% internationally. And as I mentioned earlier, the highest prevalence rates are among 18 to 25 year olds amongst adults. Uh, typical adult prevalence gambling rates tend to, problem gambling rates tend to range between one and 2%. Uh, just to show you from some of our uh, data, um, this is from the DSM-4J uh, gambling screen, and not all items are endorsed equally. Uh, but one of the things you could see is the percentages of endorsements from those individuals who have a gambling problem. The most often, uh, we find themselves thinking about gambling at odd times of the day or planning the next time they play. Uh, lying to friends or family members how much you gamble is also very, very highly endorsed. Uh, and here we see some of the other items on the DSM-4J uh, with the one becoming restless, tense, sped up, or bad-tempered when trying to cut down or stop gambling. So, if you endorse, and you'll have these slides, uh, although these are able to be uh, acquired from the internet now, but if individual endorses four or more uh, meeting the criteria for, uh, they will be assumed to have met the criteria for probable pathological gambling. And this was based on a study we did in 2012. 
Uh, we have a poster outside our waiting room where we treat young people with gambling problems. And we uh, list all these items with the notion if you endorse four or more, you may have a gambling problem. And I've had teenagers walk in and say, you know that sign outside your door? Uh, I endorse all those items. I don't think I have a gambling problem. My mother thinks I have a gambling problem. My girlfriend thinks I have a gambling problem. My friends think I have a gambling problem. Why do I gamble? These are excerpts from information taken from gamblers. This is a male age 14. Gambling was there for me when no one else was. It made me know I was special and even powerful. The days flew by. I was in a different world. Nothing else was important to me. Of course, I stole money from my family. It's nothing personal. I needed the money. Or if you really think of it, it was easy to come up with reasons why I should keep playing. If I was winning, well, that was reason enough. But if I was losing, well, that's okay because I'd be winning soon. It's more about the chase than the actual dollars. The chase allows you to forget about everything else. Everything that was good about gambling is now bad. It's my whole life and I'm tired. I'm tired of lying and stealing for something I can't seem to control but don't want to. What has happened to me? I need help. And finally, uh, one of the most articulate young people that I've worked with uh, said, my problems are like a tree. The root is my gambling with one branch being a thief, another a liar, another being out of school and work. If you cut a branch off, you haven't gone to the root of my problem, which is gambling. So what's the profile of an adolescent problem gambler? They can be different, but these you could see on this slide, many, many of the typical traits of a problem gambler. And uh, one of the things that you will often note is that there's a need for arousal or strong sensation-seeking behaviors. So what are some of the concerns that we have? Well, first is a migration between gaming and gambling. And I, these have come from uh, con gaming consoles. This one is from the Wii and the World Championship of Poker. If you look at this, you could see on the upper left-hand corner, it says for 12 and a bit up. Uh, and if you go on the Nintendo, once again, you could see this game was made for 12 and up. But I guess if you're on a PlayStation, gambling is okay if you're three years and over. Uh, in order to teach one how to gamble. Esports is becoming much more popular. Uh, esports gambling, for those of you unaware of esports, esports are uh, teams of people who compete against each other in gaming events. And this is taken from the Staples Center in Los Angeles. And you could see they're filling stadium after stadium. In fact, today there was an article uh, that popped up on one of the websites where MGM is now looking at exploring more specifically how one can capitalize on gaming up, gambling opportunities on esports events. And here you can again see the stadium full of people uh, and um, you could see pictures of the team members and what some of the scores are. We know that uh, many colleges in the US are now having teams, uh, esports teams. And in fact, I did some work for the International Olympic Committee, and the International Olympic Committee is considering having esports as a possible Olympic event. We also have social casino gambling. As I mentioned earlier, this is the one from Party Poker, where you could game or gamble on their site for fun. And the gambling operators will tell you it's really designed to teach people how to play the gambling uh, game without risking any money. Uh, but they're widely popular. Uh, you can play poker, card games, slots, etc. Uh, there are some uh, social casino games where you can actually bet on sports for fun. Uh, 
you could bet on person via your personal computer, your mobile phone, your tablets. Uh, and we know that the mobile platform is growing quite quickly. The average age of a social casino gambler is between 35 and 44, and also more likely to be females. And there's a growing number of young people who are engaged in this behavior as well. We have more skill-based slots coming into our casinos. And here's one for Guitar Warrior or Texas T Pinball or a lot of shooting games where you, one can wager on, on your skill or use a control that really doesn't work all that well, but gives people an illusion that you can actually control the outcome. And virtual reality uh, has not uh, been oblivious to gambling operators so uh, you can actually go using some of this headgear and you can actually engage in online gambling through virtual reality. We know that internet gambling is extremely popular and this is the face of internet gambling. And uh, another important consideration is the lack of parental awareness of youth gambling problems. Uh, we've done a number of studies that show that among 13 potentially risky behaviors amongst parents, gambling actually comes in last. Uh, and we did that same study, we've replicated that study with teachers, we found the same thing, and we actually replicated it also with mental health professionals where most mental health professionals don't view gambling amongst young people as a major concern. Nevertheless, they're all willing to learn more about it. There's a proliferation of gambling venues. Illinois is a great example of that. The disease of accessibility and multiple types of games that are particularly attractive to youth. Uh, many young people are engaged in sports gambling. Uh, they feel they know everyone's statistics and they're able to predict the outcome of a game. There's growth of internet wagering and other forms of electronic gambling. And we know that the, the consequences impact a wide variety of domains. Uh, so it impacts personally, it impacts work and study skills, it impacts financial aspects or legal aspects or interpersonal aspects. Uh, and so we adopted this basically from the Australian Gambling Commission and uh, modified it for use with adolescents and young adults based upon a lot of our research. But the question may be, is youth problem gambling a primary disorder? And I wonder, I often think about whether or not if we replace the inner circle, which says problem gambling, with things like depression, could we then move problem gambling out to the side? And so when we're treating adolescents or young people with gambling problems, I think it's really important for us to remember all these other different circles as well. There are a number of issues related to treating youth with gambling problems. The first is funding. Uh, who is going to fund this? Insurance companies tend not to be willing to fund treatment issues for young people, or they may have limited number of sessions. Uh, do we do this in a school? Or do we use a hospital-based program or a community outreach program or a university program? How do you attract clientele? Uh, I do an awful lot of media work and the media work is done really to try to raise awareness amongst adults, young people, that help is available and one can actually be successful. And do we go for abstinence or hormone reduction? Uh, we tend to believe that abstinence is the preferred form of treatment, but if you only have a treatment center where abstinence is the only available option, then we know we're going to lose a lot of young people because we get many young people who come in and say to us, I don't want to stop my gambling. I just want you to teach me how to control the gambling. 
And there are many barriers to treatment, uh, including things like financial barriers to treatment or logistical barriers, transportation barriers. Uh, probably the biggest barrier is understanding that one has a gambling problem uh, and that one cannot stop without some other form of help. Now that's not to mean that natural recovery is not possible, uh, on the contrary, but what we find is that uh, young people tend to say, I could stop on my own, but actually rarely are able to do that. So strategies for working with youth, we look at prevention, cognitive therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness therapy, personalized normative feedback tends to be an area that seems to be very successful for young people where they compare their gambling behavior with their peers uh, and regress to the mean. Uh, Self-help groups are very, very popular, whether it be Gamblers Anonymous or Gammonon. Uh, the problem with self-help groups or Gamblers Anonymous is that many young people typically in those uh, venues and they tend not to be able to adjust to working with those people. And they often come away saying, gee, I'm so much better. Gambling problems among youth is pretty popular uh, in some of these groups. Uh, in fact, if you ask people when they started gambling, they will often tell you when they were fairly young. There's brief interventions and workbooks, uh, the psychodynamic therapy, this group therapy, and some pharmacological treatments, although there are no approved pharmacological treatments for adolescents. Uh, and there is some research that seems to suggest it works pretty well or in conjunction with typical therapeutic uh, strategies, it works well for adolescent, uh, young adults. I'm not going to go into this, but one of, this comes from uh, the work that's been done by Carlos de Clemente and his students in terms of assessing readiness for change. And this is the six stages of readiness for change. So to try to conclude this part, uh, we know that as gambling venues increase, so does youth gambling. Gambling has become a primary form of entertainment in our society. Uh, it's been acceptable, and it's a new rite of passage into adulthood. Gambling's also become a family activity where individuals will gamble with family members, or family members will take money in order to wager for their uh, young children. There's a significant increase in technologically-based gambling, and there's a general perception that gambling is relatively harmless activity. And this is, you know, uh, the title of one of my books actually is Gambling the Silent Addiction, or the Hidden Addiction, actually. Um, but here's, I'll end with this cartoon. Uh, and it says, it's a little difficult to read, but it says, unfortunately, the Johnsons never noticed the early warning signs that the teenage son had a gambling problem. And here's uh, little Johnny Johnson uh, bringing home a showgirl with a wad of cash in his hand. Uh, we had a mom who actually called our center and said, I don't know if my son has a gambling problem, but when I was putting away his laundry in his um, dresser, I found several hundred lottery tickets. So I want to thank you all for your kind attention. Uh, and I will try to look at some of the questions that you might have. I could stay online for a few more minutes. Th thank you, Jeff. Great presentation. I'm giggling at that <laughs> that last cartoon, man. That was that that was wonderful. And, and isn't that the truth too? Working with gamblers, adolescent or adults, you you just see the you see the consequences and it's hard to sometimes connect the dots because a lot of us, I know myself and a lot of us on the call have substance addiction backgrounds and you know, you, you see a lot of the things, but 
sometimes with this addiction it's uh, or disorder you don't see that connection but it comes out just like that cartoon it showed so thank you so much so much jeff and you've got a few questions on the chat i can read them off or you can take a look that uh, i told everybody i'd get answered along with some compliments too and i want to i want to uh, everybody who can stay on please do if you've got a couple of minutes jeff to answer questions and then uh, also please go to we know the feeling.org we know the feeling.org to get registered for january 5th webinar with mark lefkowitz going over financial recovery okay Thank you, thank you everyone. And, and Jeff, uh, you do have a few questions here on the chat. Would you like me to go through them or are you sure, taking a look I, at them now? I'm, I'm having trouble seeing the chat questions. Oh, so. No worries, I, I've got it. Um, so we had a f the first few questions, um, let's see here was, uh, Joy had asked, well, first question was with the lottery tickets and I would imagine they do get royalties, but do the themes from those lotteries, she wanted to ask, do, do there are, do they do the states have to pay out to those royalties for like uh you know uh like Il illinois with uh, gene wilder on that ticket uh for a willy wonka i would yeah, imagine absolutely. they do yeah yeah uh they, and, it, these yeah, are all they, licensed products that they buy from a licensing company mm. um the, many of the lotteries will tell us that they're really not targeting young people but trying to target adults with an period during a period of their youth so they become nostalgic but yes they have to purchase these licensing agreements and getting back to something else Robbie you had said earlier sure uh, about that last cartoon I had a young man who bought it who was winning um, and he bought himself a Rolex watch and his mother said where'd you get that <laughs> the fake <laughs> Rolex watch uh, because if he told her that he bought a real Rolex watch, he would become suspicious. He eventually had to sell that Rolex watch uh, and then lost the money gambling. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, I run the tape through, right? There's more to the story, yeah. Well, thank you for that uh, example. Yeah, that cartoon's great. Uh, she, uh, Joy also asked, uh, in Iowa, only a minuscule percentage of those who would qualify for help seek it. Seek it. Might that skew numbers for the F? the affected person's data and other states too. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, the, the general rule of thumb is that 10% of people with a gambling problem will actually ever seek any help. Um, so if you're looking at 1% of the population, you're looking at 0.1% of the population that never seeks help. With adolescents, it's even smaller percentage of people primarily because they present in different ways uh, than an adult. Uh, quite often an adult will present because their partner or spouse will say, you really have to uh, go for help or I'm leaving. And teenagers will tell us, I don't have a partner or spouse. I don't even have a girlfriend or boyfriend. I don't lose my house. I still live with my parents. I haven't lost a job. I'm still in school. So the number of adolescents or young people who are seeking help is really quite small. We're trying to train people in universities and colleges, in their uh, students' uh, fair centers, in order how to work with young people with gambling problems. And if you go online uh, or pick up any of my books, there's always some uh, chap book chapters that I've written on working and treating young people with gambling problems. Wow. Yeah, they rely on mom and dad's padding to hide. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for bringing that up. Good. Very good point. Um, also, Je hey, Brian. Brian asks, um, have, has, have you seen any positive actions uh, to lessen the harm in those youth who are, what, that you've addressed during, you know, this talk, uh, who are suffering from, you know, problem gambling behaviors or gambling disorder itself? Yeah, I think, uh, in, you know, I, I used to show pictures of Darth Vader and say that that's what the gambling industry used to look, uh, think I looked like, the evil empire. Uh, and then I started showing pictures of Yoda, the little crinkly person. And that's where I fit in more. I think we, over the last 20 years, we've seen a dramatic shift in gambling operators 
who are really concerned about harm minimization and responsible gambling. Now, are they doing it because uh, government is making them do it, or do they do it because they truly believe that's the approach? Uh, I'm not 100% sure, depending upon the jurisdiction. But I will say that there is a growing adherence amongst gaming or gambling operators to actually try to minimize the harms. Nobody wants a young person to uh, get harmed or even in fact an older person as well. And I've often argued that for the gambling industry, if you can keep people safe, you're actually going to increase your profits because people will gamble for longer periods of time. Yeah, th thank you for that. That well, you know, Jeff, that leads to the next question here about uh, you know speaking of prevention efforts. Um, uh, is it is it more effective to reach the youth or the actual youth client directly or educate the parents first? What I mean, what what have you so, seen? Yeah, it, most. I mean, there's been some work done in Illinois as well, but. The vast majority of prevention programs tend to be school-based prevention programs, uh, primarily because they're a captive audience. How do you reach parents uh, or adults? Uh, and that becomes trickier. Uh, we can reach them via the internet. Uh, we developed a couple of public service announcements around children's gambling, but that were targeting adults. Uh, Adults tend to be a tougher group to reach out to. Uh, I would say if you can uh, do public service announcements or do interviews over the telephone, now's a good time because it's holiday time and uh, we just completed a slew of interviews uh, along with the National Council on Problem Gambling, Keith White, uh, on our holiday campaign, urging parents not to buy lottery tickets for children. Uh, it seems like a fairly innocuous thing, but we know that one of the risk factors for later gambling problems is an early big win. And so if a young person, a nine-year-old or a 10-year-old wins $50 or $100, that's a huge amount of money. If you or I won that, we would be very happy, but it wouldn't change our life. Mm. Yeah, good point. Well, Jeff, I think that's all the questions that I've seen. So, hey, thank you again very much. And thank you, Illinois. Thank you, the Illinois Department of Human Services. Kelly, I know you're on the line. I appreciate and I enjoy working with you. And I, I look forward to 2021. And, and I hope to have you back, Jeff, as, as a speaker again in the future. Uh, so uh, thanks for all you do. Thanks for this great presentation. Thanks very much, Robbie. Thank you all for your attendance and participation and your interesting questions. Thanks, okay. everybody. Thank Stay you. And have a happy holiday. Yes, happy holiday, everyone. Thank you.